right. So we're going to start out with uh, some fundamentals for a successful garden, whether it's in the summer or a winter. But we're going to talk particularly about how you want to be treating your soil, dealing with watering issues, aeration, and sun in a winter vegetable garden. And then once we uh, go through those fundamentals, uh, we'll get into a whole wide range of different crops that you can grow in your winter vegetable garden. I'll uh, give you some suggestions on when you should be planting those crops um, and how to avoid uh, common problems or solve problems if they develop. And then we're gonna finish up with at least a brief discussion of cover crops in the winter garden uh, how you would go about planting them and harvesting them to maximize the benefits that they can bring to your uh, garden. So the four foundations of success. Um, if you've been tuning in to our webinars on a regular basis, this isn't the first time you've seen the slide. Uh, we keep coming back to it because it really does highlight four foundations of having a successful gardening experience, having healthy soil, watering properly, uh, maintaining aeration in your uh, garden soil, and paying attention to the sun needs of your plant are really critical. So um, building healthy soil. If you've tuned into some of the webinars we've done about soils and composting, you know that a healthy soil is full of life. It has a lot of beneficial bacteria, and fungi, earthworms, other life. And those uh, critters and having them healthy is very important for your garden. Uh, the microorganisms in the soil actually interact a lot with your plants uh, and they share resources. Uh, specifically, as your plants are producing sugars through photosynthesis, uh, they're sharing some of that sugar with the microorganisms. Uh, it's a source of nutrients to keep the microorganisms healthy. And what the microorganisms are doing are breaking down the nutrients that are in your soil and making them accessible to your plants. Uh, so we need to do what we can to maintain uh, a healthy soil. Uh, right now, you've probably got summer crops going and you're growing things like tomatoes and peppers and maybe eggplants and zucchinis and maybe even something like watermelon or other melons. All those fruits uh, are growing on plants that need to develop a lot of energy. Uh, so they're using a lot of the nutrients that are in your soils. Uh, so I re really suggest that before you start your winter garden, you think about testing. Now, if you've never done a commercial uh, uh, test, having a soil lab test your soils, I recommend that you check that out. Uh, if, uh, if you do the survey that uh, we're going to be posting links in the chat room for, uh, you'll be able to receive the handout from this webinar and it's gonna have a link that'll take you to a place on our Master Gardener website uh, where it lists uh, commercial soil labs that will do soil testing for home gardeners. Uh, think about doing that. If, uh, if you wanna get it done before you start your summer garden, it's time to do that right now so you can have the results. And the results will give you advice on what you do to address any uh, deficits. Um, if you don't have enough nitrogen, you'll know that. Uh, you might be surprised. The first time I did a soil test, I actually recognized for the first time that I was providing too much phosphorus because I kept putting on a um, fertilizer that had uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in it, and my garden didn't need phosphorus. So it's worth testing to see where you are. If you don't want to invest the time um, and money right now for a commercial test, at least go to a nursery or go online and uh, buy yourself a home test kit. It'll at least give you the fundamentals. Chances are pretty good. You might need to add uh, at least some nitrogen, maybe some of the other fundamentals that you would be able to test in a home test uh, kit. 
if you find that uh, your uh, soils do need some additional nutrients, I recommend for a winter garden that you use an organic fertilizer. Basically, the world of fertilizers are either organic, and you'll know it's organic if it has one of the symbols that I've included in the slide indicating that it's organic. That means that its nutrients are all derived from either uh, animal or plant sources. The other type of fertilizer is uh, a synthetic fertilizer uh, made of chemicals. Now, in some instances, it can be useful. Um, it provides a very quick source of um, nutrients for your garden. But the problem in the winter garden is that the synthetic nutrient uh, mixes, fertilizers, tend to be highly water soluble. And if we get rain, which we are all keeping our fingers crossed that by October, November, December, uh, we'll be having at least some rainstorms, uh, that rain or just your irrigation can easily uh, move the nutrients in a synthetic fertilizer out, leaches out very easily because they're highly water soluble. Uh, organics are a little less uh, water soluble, so it makes it a good choice. If you're going to use a synthetic, uh, look for one where you'll see on the label uh, that it's a slow release uh, uh, type. Uh, the ones that I've pictured here are all slow release. They're synthetic, uh, but they've got a coating around uh, the granulars in the fertilizer that makes them less water soluble. So they will dissolve over time as you either irrigate uh, your garden or the rain helps break it down, but they won't leach out quickly. So go for either organic or one of the slow release types. Now, hopefully we're gonna get some water uh, that uh, will really make it easy for you to uh, keep your garden irrigated. I found over the years that when we do get rainstorms, um, it's perfect for my garden. Uh, probably gives the plants a little more water than I might have given them through irrigation. But as long as you're uh, uh, gardening in an area that's got decent drainage, uh, that'll be just fine. Even if we don't get the rain, one of the nice things about a winter garden is it will less, need less irrigation. Uh, for one thing, uh, when you finally start taking out those tomatoes and replacing it with some of the winter crops, uh, maybe you're going to take out your tomatoes and follow it with uh, some Swiss char, you're going to be starting either from seed or very young seedlings that are very small. So they will uh, naturally need less water than you've probably been providing for your tomato. Uh, even when those plants grow up, they're going to take less water because our days are shorter. There'll be less uh, heat uh, during the day. And that means that there's less evaporation of uh, moisture in your soils. And frankly, your plants are giving up uh, less moisture as they photosynthesize. Uh, by comparison, if I'm growing uh, in my garden, in Pleasant Hill, where I live, a zucchini right now, and let's say it's two feet across. In July, that zucchini needed two gallons of water per week uh, in order to have sufficient uh, water. Uh, by contrast, when I plant my uh, broccoli uh, in next, you know, next month, I'm going to get broccoli in, and by the first of November it's probably going to be two feet across, uh, but it's not going to need two gallons of water, even if, though it's the same size as the zucchini in July. Uh, it's only going to need um, 0.47 uh, gallons uh, in Pleasant Hill growing in full sunlight. So you'll use less water. It's important that you pay attention to the moisture levels. Uh, uh, I like to use a water meter like you see on the left uh, side of the slide. Uh, it tells me what the moisture level is uh, six to eight inches uh, below the surface, which is where the roots are. Or you can, uh, you know, next to your uh, 
uh, plants dig down to where the root zone is. If you're irrigating properly or if we're getting uh, rain, uh, you should be providing moisture to the entire garden bed. So you can test it away from where the immediate roots are. Just dig down, take a handful. If it clings together, like you see in the picture, it's good to go. Um, if you squeeze it and it's oozing water, it's probably been overwatered, pulled off. Uh, and if it just crumbles, it needs water. Uh, so get used to testing it. Be sure when you plant in the winter that you're choosing a place that's going to get good drainage, though, because you don't want a situation like I've pictured in the slide where the water is just sitting. Uh, healthy soil has large pore areas uh, that are filled with air, and the plants actually take air up through their root systems uh, to supply the, uh, uh, what is needed for photosynthesis. So be sure that you don't overwater. That's going to fill those pores uh, with water, uh, moving out the air that should be there. Uh, you also want to be very careful in a winter garden not to do anything that will compact the garden soil. Um, if it's been raining, let the soil dry well before you dig in it. Be sure that you're not walking in it. You're not letting your pets or your children walk in it. Uh, after the tomatoes come out, uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, have anybody walking on it. And even as you're harvesting those tomatoes and taking them out, uh, be careful uh, to avoid compacting the soil. Okay, sun requirements. Um, if you're sun challenged in your yard, the good news is that the winter vegetables are going to require less sunshine than the typical things that we grow during the summer. Your tomatoes and peppers and zucchinis and melons, they all want minimum of six hours and they do a lot better in 10 or more hours of sunlight. Uh, but the things that we grow in uh, the winter, we're growing either to um, uh, pull them up from the roots, like your carrots or beets, or we're going to harvest immature flowers, that's your broccoli and cauliflower, uh, or we're going to uh, harvest something like seed pods, your, um, your peas. All of those crops uh, will do well four to six hours per day. Uh, we also grow a lot of crops in the winter months that uh, we're going to eat their leaves. Think about your lettuce and your spinach, kale and char, bok choy. Uh, they can get by on two to four hours per day. Now be sure to pay attention to what the sun is doing in your garden. Our days are going to be shorter, so that may result in less sun. Uh, but the um, sun is also lower on the horizon, which can change the shade patterns. Uh, so pay, start paying attention to how much... Uh, uh, sun you're getting and watch it through the winter months so that you'll know for uh, uh, the crops in the future uh, just how much you're going to get. Uh, the other thing, uh, I'm about to tell you that there are some crops that you should be getting into your garden as early as this month or certainly by September. And chances are we're going to continue to have some of the same kind of hot weather that we've experienced uh, over the last week or so going into September. So it is possible uh, that you'll want to provide a little protection for those young seedlings that are going into the garden by using some kind of a shade cloth system. Crops to grow in Contra Costa County in the winter months. Let's start by talking about how you're going to uh, uh, grow those, how you're going to start those. Uh, there are um, a lot of root vegetables that can be grown in the winter months, uh, carrots and beets, uh, for example. Uh, those should always be planted by seed directly in your soil. Now, I can tell you, uh, I've you know been going to the nurseries for many years and seeing little uh, uh, six packs that purport to have uh, seedlings of carrots or beets. Save your money. Uh, I'm going to tell you in this program how you can start those seeds, when to start them, 
they'll grow fine from seed and they don't transplant very well. So save your money on the seedlings, buy seeds if you're gonna grow the root vegetables. Now, if you're gonna grow uh, any of the brassicas, and we'll talk about all of the ones that are listed here, broccoli, cauliflower, Romanesco, Brussels sprouts, and kohlrabi, those should all be started outside of the garden and transferred into your garden as uh, seedlings. Uh, so some of them, uh, you still have time to start your seeds now. We'll talk about that as we get into it. Uh, it takes about six weeks uh, from the time you plant your seeds until they'll be ready to go into the garden. Uh, so a few of them, you still have time. Some of them uh, for this year, you're gonna wanna buy uh, seedlings at the uh, nursery for the brassica plants. Then there are a few that you can start either way. Uh, the, all of the things that we grow uh, to eat the leaves, the arugula, lettuce, spinach, et cetera, uh, those can be planted either as seedlings or as seeds. Um, the uh, peas can be done either way. Um, and then the other things that you see listed here, and we'll talk more specifically about uh, most of them as we go forward. So believe it or not, these are the ones that you wanna get into your garden in either August or September. Uh, quite candidly, if you live in West County that has the cool marine influence, I would really recommend that you try to get these crops, the cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, and Romanesco into your garden um, in the next two or three weeks, uh, certainly by the early part of September. If you live where I live in uh, the central part of the county, or you live in the east county or south county, I try to get them in no later than the end of September. Um, broccoli in particular, you'll have another choice chance to start it in February, uh, but because of the timing on these, um, if you uh, are living in Central or East County, you could probably start seeds in the next day or two, have them ready to go into the garden by the end of September. But if you're in West County, uh, start going to the nurseries and finding these as uh, young seedlings. Okay, broccoli is a fun one to grow. Uh, of the ones that I listed on the slide earlier, broccoli is the one that you're gonna, um, if you grow it successfully, uh, you're gonna grow a nice big head like you see on the left. And then most varieties of broccoli, um, after you harvest the main uh, head, the immature flower, are, it's gonna continue to try to put out small flowers because it still wants to produce seeds. Uh, so you'll have those side shoots, and usually you can continue to harvest those for weeks or maybe even a couple months after you've uh, harvested that main stem. Uh, so it's kind of a long producer, unlike the uh, cauliflower or the uh, Romanesco or the cabbage, where you're going to harvest one large head, hopefully, uh, and you're not going to have uh, the side shoots starting. Uh, particularly for the cauliflower. If you're growing a white cauliflower and you want it to uh, continue to be nice and white, uh, as you start seeing the head of the broccoli form and start growing, uh, tie the, the large leaves up around that head. Uh, that'll keep it out of the direct sunlight and keep its nice white color. Uh, also be aware of the size of these plants, um, which I've illustrated with the uh, cabbage. Now, very honestly, I've never seen a cabbage in my own garden that large. I have seen them in my niece's garden. She gardens in Juneau, Alaska, and uh, grows these kind of crops um, in the summer months. Uh, but uh, be aware of the size of the plant. I have had people ask me how many broccolis they can put in a large container that's 16 inches across. The answer is one. They grow pretty large. If you haven't grown kohlrabi, it's one that I uh, 
really recommend that you consider uh, trying this year. Uh, it's uh, unlike the cauliflower or the cabbage, you're not harvesting uh, the immature flower. What you're harvesting for a kohlrabi is actually considered a stem. As the plant matures, you see the swelling, uh, kind of the global shape. Well, that's the stem. And it comes both in the light green color that you see, as well as in a purple color. It's uh, a delicious uh, uh, vegetable. Uh, I like to eat it raw. It's kind of crispy, um, very nice. Uh, and in addition to the, um, the stem part of it, the, the main global part, you can also harvest the small stems and the leaves. They're a nice addition to a stir fry or um, a salad. Uh, so think about growing it. It also is gonna produce a little more quickly than your broccoli or cauliflower. Uh, so if you started planting it um, in September, early September, probably six weeks later or so, it's gonna be ready to harvest. And it won't be too late to plant this one if you plant it either in September or October. You might even uh, get some seeds, uh, get them started so that you can start your first crop in September and then uh, start some more seeds maybe three or four weeks later. And then when you harvest the first ones, you can replace them and uh, have a second crop uh, that will be able to mature. Now the Brussels sprouts, um, I'll warn you about these. I personally find them the most challenging. Some years I've been able to successfully grow uh, Brussels sprouts um, in Pleasant Hill. Uh, some years, even though I see, try to do everything the same, I have less success. It's, it's a little bit dependent on the climate. But the important thing is, is that these, um, if you wanna grow them, um, it's probably too late, frankly, if you live in West County, give them a try, but get them started in the next day or two. And the same thing in uh, the central part of the county or uh, East County, get these in, in the next week. And when you buy them, hopefully uh, the plant label, you'll buy them as seedlings and hopefully the plant label will show you that it's about 90 days to maturity. Uh, those are the ones you want to get uh, uh, at this time of year. There's also a long season variety that takes 150 days to mature, um, and it's too late to successfully grow those. Now, if you do get these started, this is a nice crop uh, because if you've seen these um, at the grocery stores, you can buy them in the grocery store, but it always seemed to me like an awful lot of Brussels sprouts to need to deal with or store. Um, so in your garden, they tend to mature from the bottom of the stock up. So you can start harvesting them, harvest what you need for a meal, and then come back uh, three or four days later and you can harvest again. So it's fun to try them. Uh, just realize that uh, uh, they are the hardest in my estimation of, of the brassicas to grow successfully in our uh, particular climate. Now, problems to avoid. Uh, the, if you grow a broccoli or a cauliflower, or frankly, a cabbage, and you get no head forming at all, or you get a very small head, it's a problem called buttoning. And it's because uh, you didn't trust me uh, to tell you to get them in your garden uh, before the end of September. Instead, you trusted the nurseries who will have young seedlings for sale in October, November. Trust me, you go to the nursery, you'll find them, but save your money. It's too late in our county to get them growing. Uh, they, the plants have to really mature when we're still having warmer weather, longer days, in order to be able to grow quite large and store the energy that they need to produce um, a large flower, because that's what you're going to be harvesting. So get them planted in time to avoid that problem. Now, if you're going to grow any of the brassicas, um, 
if you don't take steps to protect against it, I can guarantee you're going to find something's been nibbling on the leaves. Very common problem. And this, in this case, is not your slugs or your snails. It's most likely that pretty little white butterfly with the black dots on its wing that darts around uh, your garden always seems to be able to find the brassicas. It lights on it. And probably every time that it lands on uh, your broccoli plant, it's uh, laying a small egg. Uh, hard to see. Uh, they're not invisible, but if you get out your reading glasses or a little magnifying glass, you'll be able to see them if they're there. Uh, you will certainly notice them uh, when they hatch because you'll start seeing a whole lot of uh, holes in the leaves. Uh, they hatch out as a tiny little caterpillar, about a quarter of an inch long. Uh, they're ravenous and they grow very quickly. And you're going to be putting these in your garden in September. Um, if we have our normal heat, uh, that caterpillar can grow uh, to from a, about a quarter inch in length to an inch and a half, leaves the plant, it goes into a chrysalis and emerges as a little white butterfly. Uh, so what do you do about that? Well, one thing you can do in general is to avoid using pesticides in your garden that might hurt the natural enemies because natural enemies uh, like to take advantage of the caterpillars that they find in your garden. This little uh, uh, fly, the cachinid fly, tiny little fly, uh, will lay its eggs right on the uh, caterpillar that it finds and its larva will kill the caterpillar. Uh, so that's one approach. Uh, I have found in my garden that uh, the little beneficials aren't able to keep up with the number of uh, caterpillars. So here's some other alternatives. There actually is a pesticide that you can use for caterpillars this particular one, as long as you check the label and find that its only active ingredient is Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt, um, that will not hurt beneficial insects. It will not hurt your bumblebees. But if you um, spray it onto your uh, brassica plants and the caterpillars uh, eat the plants where you've sprayed it, uh, it will kill them. Uh, what Bacillus thuringiensis is, it's a bacteria. In fact, it's one of those beneficial bacteria that is commonly found in soils. But the pesticide manufacturers have uh, found a way to uh, put it into a solution where you would typically mix it with water and spray it on your plants. It works best if you do it while the caterpillars are very young uh, as soon as they consume it, they're going to quit eating. It takes a couple of days for the caterpillar to die, but it will quit nibbling on your plants. Um, the, one of the downsides is that the, it doesn't last a long time after you spray it. So if you're going to rely on this, pay attention. And if you're seeing new feeding going on, you're going to need to reapply this maybe as frequently as every four or five days. Now I'm a little lazy, I don't wanna spray all that time. So here's my solution. As soon as I put these crops in the ground, um, I am covering them either with a row cover, like the, the white uh, that you see on the um, right-hand side, or I like shade cloth because I can see through it. If you use a row cover, it'll work. Just be sure that you peek under it on a daily basis. Um, more than one time, I have planted seedlings of broccoli in my garden that already had eggs that I hadn't noticed. And after a couple of days, uh, the caterpillars have been feeding. So be sure to check. And then if you see feeding going on, just hand pick them off. Okay, here's another challenge uh, that we sometimes have with broccoli. Uh, and that is that the flowers want to open before you've harvested the head. Uh, usually, if I'm planting my crops in September in Pleasant Hill, 
Uh, the broccoli is probably uh, starts to form in January. Maybe uh, I can start harvesting it by the middle end of January. Um, and I usually don't get the flowers opening at that point in time. Uh, what causes the flowers to open are temperatures that are in the high 70s, low 80s. Now, occasionally we might get that in January, but not normally. So uh, get your uh, crops planted now. Uh, you can plant broccoli again um, early next February and uh, it can mature, but you're at more at risk of the early blooming. Uh, same thing with uh, the cauliflower. If the temperatures get too high, uh, you'll see that it, it starts to wanna open as well. Uh, you sometimes see these, frankly, in, even in the farmer's market, they're perfectly good to eat, um, but just get them harvested if you see this happening because it's not gonna go away. Okay, more crops that you wanna start in August or September. Uh, if you live near the coast, uh, carrots, it's probably best to get them in this month. Uh, if you live uh, more inland, the central or Eastern part, uh, plant your carrots either in August or September. Uh, beets, uh, you can plant them as early as July, certainly in August. Uh, once they start maturing, uh, hopefully it's uh, cooled down a bit. Just leave them in the ground and you can harvest them over time. Uh, if you live in central or eastern part of the county, uh, starting them in the fall uh, sometimes works. Start them in September can be a little challenging because they really prefer the daytime temperatures to be 75 degrees or less. And oftentimes uh, out in the Eastern and the Central part, it gets warmer than that in September. Uh, if you find that um, your fall crop doesn't uh, do well, uh, try it again in February because that's another, that's a better time if you live in Central or Eastern uh, parts of the county to suit the climate that they like uh, with daylight, daytime uh, highs under 75. So uh, carrots, uh, when you start your carrots, uh, uh, be sure you're not adding any fresh uh, source of manure. Uh, if you're going to add compost to your garden bed before you plant your carrots, uh, check the ingredients in the uh, compost to be sure that you're not adding um, uh, manure, uh, it can cause problems such as the ones you see on this slide uh, where the roots bifurcate and split up. Uh, other things that can cause that are poor soil preparation. If you've got clay soil, it's hard for those carrots to grow well. Try a container. That's my favorite uh, way of growing carrots anyway, is to use a container and they do very well in a container. Also be careful with your water too much water or erratic water where the plants are getting enough water to survive, but maybe the soil is drying a little too much before you water, that can also uh, cause the forking. Uh, they're good to eat, but a whole lot harder to peel with a, uh, a carrot peeler. The uh, also avoid overcrowding. Now I, uh, included photos here of the beets and carrots, the way you want to see them, nicely spaced with nice uh, uh, carrots and nice beets forming. But if you're finding that uh, your plants are not uh, swelling as the plant matures, they're probably overcrowded. Overcrowding can uh, uh, cause them not to produce nice uh, roots. So to avoid that, um, you gotta be very careful, particularly with the carrot seeds. The beet seeds are a little larger, but carrot seeds in particular are very small. And if you um, uh, aren't careful when you plant them and they're overcrowded, you've gotta be very diligent in thinning them because the plants want to be about two and a half to three inches apart in order to form a nice root. Uh, here's how I've handled that situation. Uh, for a number of years, I learned about pelleted carrot seeds when I did the Master Gardener training program. 
And I was delighted to hear that you could get these pelleted seeds that have a little clay-like coating on them, makes it a lot easier to space them at two and a half to three inches apart when you plant them. They show up well. You can kind of uh, spread them around your container, be sure that the uh, spacing is right, and then cover them up with the half inch of soil that they need, and you're good to go. Uh, I then learned that um, one of the problems that using pelleted seeds can create is that natural seeds are going to be able to germinate for three or four years. So when you uh, buy your seeds, if you store it properly in a cool, dry place, uh, put a date on it because you'll be able for at least three years to rely on pretty good germination but the pelleting process slows the germination. So only trust those for a year. My solution uh, that I uh, learned on a YouTube presentation and have been adopting, and it does very well for me, is to make my own carrot seed tape. I take a paper towel, I cut it into strips that are about three quarters of an inch wide, I then take some of that white glue like uh, kids use in nursery school, uh, the water soluble glue, put a little dot on it, three inches apart, and then put one carrot seed. Uh, lay them across my container, cover them up with a half an inch of potting mix, uh, water them well, keep them water. Uh, carrots take, a, probably about three weeks, 21 days. You wonder what's happening. Uh, it just seems to take forever for them to pop up. They need to be kept moist the whole time. And remember, I just told you to get these started in September. It's going to be hot. Check at least twice a day to be sure that uh, they're staying moist. I keep a water pitcher right next to my container and usually water them both in the morning and the afternoon until they're well up. Okay, now we're gonna start talking about some things that uh, you have a, a bit of time uh, before you have to plant. So you're probably gonna wanna keep those tomatoes in until at least the end of September because they'll still be producing. Uh, but um, here's some ideas of things that you can replace uh, the tomatoes with um, once you've decided that they've produced enough tomatoes for you. Any of your peas can be planted in September or October. Again, you can plant either from seeds or you can buy seedlings uh, at the nursery for these. Pay attention uh, to the label on your seedlings or your seed package. They come either in a bush style that's only going to grow maybe 12 to 14 inches uh, in height, or they're going to grow on and need a trellis. If they're going to need a trellis, uh, if you're planting from seeds, uh, put the trellis up, then place your seeds. Now, I will warn you, the birds have discovered that I plant uh, peas every year and they tend to find either the seeds or the young seedlings. So I wanna get them uh, covered with something uh, until they're four or five inches um, uh, up as seedlings to keep the birds out of them. Uh, another hint for these is um, if you're gonna start from seeds uh, the, the day before, uh, put them in some water, let them soak overnight or, you know, 12 to 14 hours before you're going to uh, plant them. Uh, it'll make them germinate uh, a little more quickly. The other thing, uh, I'm going to go back for just a minute, because um, if you are growing any zucchini or other squashes or melons, chances are pretty good that you're seeing um, powdery mildew uh, on your leaves. Now, the good news for the summer crops is that it takes energy from the plant, maybe slows down the production of the zucchinis a little bit, but it doesn't harm the quality of those that do mature. But if you get powdery mildew on your peas, it will affect the taste because it'll affect the pods. Uh, so look on the packaging, look for ones that are resistant to powdery mildew. Uh, they'll do better. 
Okay, another good crop to plant in October are alliums. Um, just be aware for the garlic uh, that uh, people sometimes think that it's not producing. And that's simply because they haven't been patient enough. If you start your garlic in October, don't plan to be able to harvest it until June. So you're gonna to need to think about what's gonna be in your summer garden and put the garlic in a place uh, where you can start uh, the crop that's gonna follow it uh, as late as June. You're probably gonna be wanting to start your tomatoes um, in the month of May. Uh, so uh, plan ahead for where you're gonna put the garlic. Uh, the leeks and green onions can also be planted um, in October. Uh, if you plant uh, green onions from seed in October, you can probably start harvesting uh, the uh, green onions um, in December. Uh, these plants are heavy feeders. Uh, be sure you check your nitrogen level in the soil where you're going to plant them. Uh, and then check again next spring, particularly if you see the uh, leaves on them turning yellow at all. Um, they are heavy nitrogen feeders. Now, this is a problem that I personally had for many years. I always uh, looked at the planting guide. It told me I could start onions in October or November. I did that and I never got nice bulbs or rarely got nice bulbs. I grew a lot of onion flowers. Now, why did that happen? Well, for one thing, when I first started out, uh, before I was ever a master gardener, um, I went to the nurseries and I saw those nice little, they call them sets, little miniature onion bulbs uh, that you can grow onions from. Now, what I didn't realize is that onions are a biennial plant. That means that they want to go through their life cycle over two years. If you're growing something like a zucchini, it's an annual. It's going to start from seed, grow into a plant, produce uh, the zucchinis that have the seeds inside them, uh, and then it's going to die all in a single uh, crop year. Your onions, though, want to do that over two years. What I hadn't realized when I bought the sets were that growers actually start these from seeds. They intentionally crowd the plants together so that when the bulbs start swelling, they don't have uh, room and they're really not nourished very well, so they don't grow very large. Uh, then they let the tops uh, die back, cut them off, and they sell them to you and me. Uh, but that little bulb is now one year old. When you plant it, it wants to go to flowers. So they can produce a nice quick uh, uh, crop of green onions, but only use the sets to grow the green onions. Um, if you try to let them mature, you're going to find that uh, almost all of them are going to put out uh, flowers because they're already one year old. Now, when I planted my seeds uh, in uh, October or November, I thought I would get better results, but I didn't. And I think why I didn't was I planted them in October. They grew really nicely. Uh, maybe in December, we had one of those below 32 degree uh, nights, maybe a couple of them, the nights when you have to cover your lemon tree because it's too cold. Um, well, the onion thinks it's winter. And then inevitably by January, we might get some of those 70 degree days, but then it would turn cold again. And the onion would be tricked into thinking that it was uh, in, planted in October, had its first winter in December, uh, started its second year in January, and then it wants to uh, produce flowers. So I've had much more reliable success if I plant my onion seeds or frankly, little seedlings uh, in February. If you go to a nursery in February, you'll probably find four inch pots that are full of little onion seedlings. Uh, they're kind of tricky to tease apart, but if you plant them you know, spaced uh, three or four inches uh, 
apart from each other about uh, the summer solstice, June 21st, you're gonna start seeing uh, nice bulbs start forming. They're daylight dependent on when the bulbs start forming. But if you start them as seedlings in your garden in February, uh, start expecting them to start swelling by the end of June and probably be ready to harvest sometime in July. Now, even when I couldn't grow reliable onion bulbs, I always had success with shallots. And I love it because when you buy the shallots uh, at a grocery store, they tend to be fairly expensive. Um, if you take one of the bulbs like is pictured on the right hand side and you break it open, you'll find the smaller bulbs like the ones that I uh, have pictured on the left part of the slide. You plant one of those, um, uh, plant it deep enough that you have maybe inch, inch and a quarter of soil above it. And each of those small bulbs will form a cluster of the larger bulbs. I do recommend that you go to the nursery to get your bulbs to start. Uh, but frankly, I did that probably six years ago now. Um, and I always uh, try to rotate them to a new place in my garden. So I haven't had any diseases develop. And I always save some of the shallots that I've grown to start um, in October, November timeframe the following year. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, been a very reliable and inexpensive crop because I invested in the good seeds. I pay attention to be sure that my uh, plants stay healthy. And then I just reuse uh, the bulbs season after season. You can start them in October. You can also start another crop in February. All right, another good thing is anything that uh, you're gonna be consuming the leaves, uh, they can be planted either as seedlings or as seeds in the month of October. So they're also good ones to follow up the tomatoes that uh, you leave in to uh, continue to produce into the fall months. Um, they're all nice uh, pick and pick again crops. All of these, if you harvest just the older leaves on the outside of the plant uh, and leave the inner ones uh, to grow, uh, they'll produce the entire season for you. Um, the char is even better. Char is a biennial plant. So if you start it for the first time in your garden this fall, either as young seedlings or as seeds, uh, you can leave it in the uh, garden uh, next summer uh, and next fall again. Uh, it's a biennial. So the following summer, it's gonna wanna uh, start producing um, uh, seeds, uh, but it's pretty reliable for two years. And it's a nice one if you've got room in your garden to to leave in uh, to harvest all summer. Okay, so again, what can you start in February? That's when you want those onion seedlings. If you wanna grow your own seedlings, uh, start in January so they're ready to go out in February. Uh, potatoes, you could in theory, particularly in West County, uh, grow potatoes uh, starting about now. Uh, they are very cold sensitive. So if you're particularly in central or eastern part of the county and you want to try it, uh, just be aware that you're going to have to provide some frost protection on uh, cold nights. Also, you're probably this time of year going to have a hard time finding uh, seedlings, uh, the seed potatoes at the nursery. You do want to buy uh, disease-free uh, starts for your potatoes. Uh, we all know the ones you buy in the grocery store will sprout even in your pantry. Uh, they would sprout when you plant them, uh, but you do risk introducing diseases if you do that. My strong recommendation for potatoes is to plant them in containers. If you plant them in a raised bed or directly into your um, uh, backyard area, uh, you will never be able to harvest every potato and they will re-sprout. And you really don't want to uh, allow those volunteers that come up to grow. Uh, it risks introducing uh, soil-borne diseases to grow the same crop um, year after year. 
I've included on the handout a, a link that will show you uh, the way to a very nice um, article that was published a few years ago that will tell you how to grow your potatoes. You uh, start them in a container with just three or four inches of soil and you fill it up as you go along. Uh, and it produces a, a huge number of uh, potatoes if you do it that way. But get the handout and look for the link. Okay, um, put your broccoli in, uh, but if it starts uh, uh, flowering, uh, just you know, be aware it's time to harvest it because it's all temperature related. Uh, you can do that kohlrabi again if you want the kohlrabi uh, to be planted in February. Start your seeds indoors in January and it will be ready to go out by mid-February. So we can start talking about cover crops. So as I just mentioned, um, it's very important for your soil health to have something growing in your beds. And frankly, it looks a lot prettier as well. I'm only going to very briefly uh, talk about cover crops tonight. And the reason is, uh, Stay tuned, the uh, webinar that uh, the Master Gardener program will be doing in collaboration with the library during the month of September is going to be devoted entirely to cover crops. Uh, so you'll uh, tune in then, uh, or if you can't make it on the night that it's broadcast, uh, uh, find it on our website and you'll get all the ins and outs. But I'm gonna tell you briefly about it, uh, just kind of whet your appetite and be sure that you uh, know that when you uh, start removing your summer vegetables, um, what you are gonna want to have on hand uh, to replace them with, to grow uh, your cover crops. So uh, uh, here, uh, in our county, uh, they, they're basically a couple of types of main cover crops that are used, uh, legumes or grains. Uh, now, legumes are the one I was mentioning earlier, that if you plant the legumes after you take out your summer crops, uh, they're all going to produce uh, flowers, um, and they can look very pretty. What you're seeing on the slide here are um, uh, vetch on the left, uh, red clover, uh, field peas, and fava beans. Now fava beans uh, are a great cover crop. Uh, another strategy is to um, allow some of them to grow to maturity because they're also a wonderful crop to harvest for yourself. But the benefit of legumes for your garden um, as uh, your tomatoes and peppers are growing, they're using up the nitrogen in your soil. Legumes have the ability uh, to fix nitrogen in their root nodules. Uh, on the slide, I've pictured uh, some of the little nodules that um, if you were to plant some of the uh, uh, legume crops and pull them up after they have uh, started producing their flowers, you would find these little uh, nodules and they're full of nitrogen. They can do a wonderful job of supplying the resupplying the nitrogen that your um, summer crops have used up. Now, in order to be able to capture that benefit, uh, you have to harvest them uh, before they start uh, producing their seed or for the peas or the fava beans before they start producing those pods that contain their seeds. Because the reason that the plant is producing these nodules is it's going to be used as a source of um, food to um, really support the production of seeds. So what you're going to do is let them grow um, long enough to form the nodules, but then harvest them and leave those nodules in your soil. And they'll probably produce for many of your summer crops, the nitrogen that is needed uh, to start those summer crops. The other type of uh, crop that is common uh, to grow in a climate like ours would be a grain cover crop. Uh, the grains tend to have very uh, uh, deep uh, roots. 
Uh, they're able actually to mine some of the nutrients that may have leached too deep in your soils for some of your vegetable crops to be able to reach. So they can uh, capture the nutrients. They um, improve the texture of the soil. Um, and they're, um, they're wonderful uh, for those purposes. They'll also prevent erosion. Uh, the, um, if we do get heavy rains, uh, having something growing uh, so that the, uh, the heavy rains don't uh, uh, erode your soil is a good thing. The, uh, what I've got pictured um, is rye, barley, and oats. Uh, buckwheat, the bottom ripe, is a good grain cover crop, but don't try to grow it in the winter in our climate. Uh, it can be used as a summer uh, cover crop, and I'm pretty confident that the uh, presentation in September is going to talk about uh, summer cover crops as well. So for all these cover crops, you're going to be uh, planting seeds. Uh, I'm now starting to see, even in the big box stores, I'm seeing seed packages uh, for cover crops. Uh, so you can find them in your nurseries, uh, other places that sell seeds, certainly online. Uh, just be aware that if you're gonna uh, plant the legume, you're also gonna wanna use an inoculant. The inoculant actually adds a specific uh, bacteria that is necessary for the legumes to be able to produce uh, those nice nodules. Um, if you've grown uh, legumes before of the same type, it may already be in your soils, but if not, um, it really helps to inoculate the seeds. You're just gonna uh, wet the seeds uh, so they're damp and then sprinkle the powdered um, uh, inoculant uh, I will have to tell you that when I've looked at the nurseries and seen um, the seeds, I typically have not been able to find the inoculants at the same place. Uh, so you may have to get the inoculant online if, if they're not selling it where you um, find your seeds. Um, harvesting, uh, for all of these crops, uh, you're going to be cutting it at the uh, level of the soil. Uh, with any of the implements you see that I've uh, pictured there, uh, you just cut it down. You're going to leave the uh, roots in the soil. Uh, those roots will have those nice nodules if you're growing the legumes, um, or uh, they'll be very deep. Um, structure if you're growing grain crops, um, just uh, it'll break down over time and it'll be a good source of nutrients for your soil um, as it breaks down. So the roots definitely leave in the soil. Uh, the upper biomass, uh, lots of things you can do. You can till it in. Um, frankly, when I've grown cover crops, and I've only grown them for the past couple of years as I've learned about the benefits they bring, um, there's typically so much biomass that it, uh, there's no way I could till it into the raised beds uh, where I'm growing it. So what I often do will till some in, add some to my compost pile, trying to break it into small bits so that it'll break down easily. And then um, it makes a wonderful mulch. Uh, your vegetable gardens should have some kind of a mulch. This is a nice mulch to use. Um, I've even had enough biomass that I can take some of the biomass from the bed where I grew cover crops and share it over on a bed where I might have been growing uh, broccoli or some other uh, winter crop. So it makes a good mulch. Uh, just plan uh, to do the harvesting of your uh, cover crops three to six weeks. Six weeks is probably better than three. It gives it a little more time um, to break down. But then if you're using it as a mulch, just uh, make your planting holes, move it aside, um, plant your tomato seedlings right in the mulch. It makes a, a nice mulch that will keep your uh, soils uh, a little cooler during the summer growing season. The grain crops, by the way, do not fix the nitrogen um, and they use nitrogen to uh, grow and to decompose. 
So um, if you're growing the grains, wait at least six weeks and you might need to add a little uh, supplemental nitrogen uh, while that's going on to help the uh, grain crop break down a little more quickly.